Good morning and welcome to Policy Exchange. My name is Benedict Macalinan and I'm a senior advisor here at Policy Exchange's Energy and Environment Unit. We're here this morning to launch the new edition of Policy Exchange's journal Environmental Affairs. The journal was launched earlier in 2021 to provide a platform for export, expert voices from outside the traditional realms of environmental policy and to explore those policy areas that are increasingly overlapping with environmental issues. One industry that is feeling the pressure for green reform as much as any is the investment sector. The need to access its capital pools to deliver $5 trillion per year in low carbon energy is a top priority on the path to net zero. Understanding the complex financial risks of climate change is a first order challenge for financial stability. And doing all of this while supporting prosperity and growth is a political imperative. For those reasons and more, our new edition focuses on the topic of unleashing climate capital. It's an issue policy exchange visited earlier this year with our, our paper Capital Shift, which set out an agenda of reforms for the UK to champion as president of both G7 and COP26. I'm delighted that our new edition continues on this theme and features commentary from political leaders including Pensions Minister Guy Opperman and former Energy Secretaries Dame Andrea Leadsom and Amber Rudd, as well as business leaders, academics and our own team here at Policy Exchange. This is no peon to ESG or impact investing. Our authors make some blistering criticisms of the current ESG agenda but they also make clear recommendations for policy intervention and reform. Leading our essayists is Dr. Dambisa Moyo, whom we're honored to host today as our keynote speak, a speaker to launch the new edition. She has published four New York Times bestsellers, and starting with groundbreaking uh, Dead Aid, and most recently her 2021 book, How Boards Work, and how they can work better in a chaotic world. She serves on the boards of Condé Nast, Chevron, and 3M, as well as the Oxford University Endowment Investment Committee. She spent 10 years as a professional economist at the World Bank and then Goldman Sachs, and holds a doctorate from Oxford and an MPA from Harvard, among other degrees and honors. She is frequently included in lists of the most influential thinkers in the world from Time Magazine, to the World Economic Forum. I can think of no one better suited to discuss with us today the twin challenges of climate change and economic prosperity. And I'm grateful to you joining us here today, Dr. Moyo. So to discuss the world, dis sorry, to discuss how the world can unleash climate capital, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Dambisa Moyo. Dambisa. Um, good morning, and thank you so much for that kind introduction and welcome. I'm delighted to be here today um, and to participate in the launch of this very important conversation, um, and specifically to participate in the broader conversation regarding the important role that not just policymaking and customers, uh, and certainly society writ large, uh, must play in the transition of the energy sector, but um, also to really provide a perspective on how specifically, excuse me, the, um, the, the role of finance and the capital markets and the private sector um, must uh, play in terms of the um, pursuit of net zero targets, but also more generally the concerns uh, around um, the, uh, the, the evolution of the energy sector. I'm delighted to be here, uh, primarily because I feel like it's an opportunity ahead of COP26 to perhaps provide and frame what I understand are some of the issues and problems that we're dealing with in addressing this important and urgent issue of climate action as well as climate change. But also, I'm delighted to be part of a, um, a publication that is very specifically focused on what exactly um, uh, we should be doing, um, not just in the business realm, but specifically around uh, public policy. And my specific contribution, which I will highlight in my remarks in a moment, um, is really providing three ways in which public policy can contribute 
um, to, uh, to unleashing capital. And this is, I, I believe, a, a very important conversation, certainly on the back of the Global Investment Summit that was held here uh, in London just last week. But in order to do that, I'd like to start off by making a few points. Um, and perhaps most importantly, for people um, who um, are not familiar with my work, um, I would like to assure you and perhaps reassure you that there is not a single boardroom um, that I have served in on the corporate business side, um, nor in the public policy space, and nor indeed in the civil service space, where there are um, not people who are fully subscribed to the idea of a low carbon future. So put another way, in all the rooms, whether it's public policy, business, or civil society in which I work, people are committed as well as determined and, and subscribed to the idea that we must pursue um, with a lot of gusto the uh, important role of an energy transition and a low carbon future. What I'd like to do is take a moment to level set and make sure that we're all working off of the same facts. And I detail this um, introduction in the document that will be published later today um, with Policy Exchange. But a, a number of facts hold true. First of all, today the world is consuming approximately 100 million barrels of energy every single day, 100 million barrels. Second point, is that there are 90% of the world's population lives in the emerging markets, the poor emer emerging market economies. An additional point is that we are polluting, according to a number of estimates from the UN, the IE, IEA, et cetera, about 50 billion tons of emissions every single year. It's worth putting this in context, particularly since we've been home for the last 18 months or so because of quarantines and the pandemic, that this number has actually gotten worse, not better, even though we were all uh, in lockdown and many of us were in lockdown. Um, the reason I think this emission number is critically important is because ultimately, um, in terms of net zero targeting and thinking about the best policies and best strategies for the private sector to act, um, this is a guide and I think this is something that is particularly worrisome because the number has only increased, leading the, uh, the Secretary General of the United Nations to say that we are in a code red for humanity. A few other statistics. The IEA, the International Energy Agency, estimates that we need approximately five trillion US dollars per year in order to meet the 2050 targets that have been put in the scenarios um, that many of you will be familiar with. Today, we are only spending about $1.9 trillion. In other words, we'll probably have to double, more than double, the current expenditure um, in terms of trying to meet that net zero target. I will say that this is something that on the one hand is equally um, daunting given the ongoing challenges of the pandemic. Many people will be aware that there are many regions of the world that still have not had a real impact in uh, delivering or uh, um, uh, being, having access to, um, to vaccines. Um, places like my home continent of, of Africa, South America, uh, Asia, you see um, pandemic numbers in terms of access to vaccines as low as 1%. And so this definitely creates a question and a tension about whether or not we deal with the urgent um, versus the important and how we might prioritize the question of providing for climate action. But suffice it to say, and many of you again will know, that some of the pledges that we've made, certainly the $100 billion um, that was earmarked to go towards emerging market economies has not been met. And a lot of that is because many of the donor economies, such as the US, the UK, and many others, um, are struggling, obviously, on the weight of debts and deficits, but also um, in the challenge of slow economic growth, and most recently, the pandemic that have, we continue to deal with around the world. I'd like to just add a couple of more statistics before I continue here. Um, one is that many of the, um, the, the supply constraints um, that we are facing in the world in the short term, certainly in the energy prices, have revealed the sort of sensitivities that the world has to grapple with in, in this energy transition. Um, let me just emphasize the point that 
in conversations, and whether it's with policy or technology or customer preferences, we need to understand that this is not just a switch from point A to point B. It's really going to be a transition. And those aspects of the transition, such as geopolitics, second order effects, um, concerns around risk mitigation versus investment are all themes that I address in this article, but must be part of the conversation if we really are to effect change and really address these net zero targets and climate action. I'll conclude um, this part by just saying one other thing, which is today we are um, approximately 80% of the energy stack is coming from fossil fuels. And in that respect, as we think about this energy transition to this new uh, low carbon future, we must not just um, throw the proverbial baby out with the bathwater. We do need to take into consideration ways and means to make the energy system that we have much more effective and much more efficient. Indeed, the IEA forecasts for the future and the future energy stack do indicate that even at 2050, we will still have approximately 20% of our energy coming from existing fossil fuels. So now that I've sort of painted this picture, I hope people will understand that the choices and decisions that we make at a place like COP next week in Glasgow must be considered in a more fulsome and thoughtful way. As I said, our ability to actually impact this transition cannot be um, only discussed in one room. Um, it really ought to be with all hands on deck and a conversation that includes not just government and public policymakers, but also the private sector, investors, as well as civil society writ large. In particular, I take issue with public policy and specifically in this article, try to articulate how specifically public policy can help to unleash capital. I would actually just very quickly like to outline the three things that I think public policy can specifically do to enhance and unleash capital earmarked towards green. The three things in very quick order, and then I'll, d I'll delve into more detail, are one, carbon pricing, really thinking about carbon pricing um, and more transparency around that can help us think about the carbon future and also the transition to net zero. Number two, thinking about the broader legal environment, one that actually creates more um, opportunity for investment in this space and one that does not discourage or, uh, or even um, uh, choke off investment um, because it's clear that innovation is going to be a clear piece of that. So I will talk to you, um, and I talk about this in the document, uh, really the tension between a rules-based system, um, which is very much preferred in uh, places across Europe, um, to what I would argue is much more innovation enhancing, which is much more principles-based uh, approach. And then finally, um, really this third area of where policy can help and support um, the, uh, to unleash investment capital is the question around um, governance. How should we be thinking specifically around corporations um, and, and boards and how they can help in thinking about uh, this very challenged um, um, uh, approach? Um, let me conclude by just very quickly making a, a, a few remarks here. With respect to carbon pricing, the IEA um, has already talked about how in the net zero scenarios, uh, we will be required to move from today's pricing, which is something around 10 to $60 per ton into CO2 estimates that are closer to as much as $200 per ton. These are enormous changes um, and incredibly costly um, if they're not done in a smooth and a considered way, which is why public policy has a critical role to play in this, um, in this respect. The second area, as I mentioned, is around transparency around the legal and the regulatory environment in which investments and decision making is made. Um, I alluded to the fact that we cannot really um, expect to have a lot of success if we have multiple conversations about tackling climate that are more um, in, in sort of dealt with in a schism. So you have public policy in one room, investors in another room, civil society somewhere else. To my mind, that is not an effective way to tackle this complex global public goods problem. We need everyone in the same room. And part of that is making sure that those discussions are had um, with a better clarity on what's actually legally and regulatorily 
uh, are possible in many different countries, not just in one country or in a, in a handful of countries. Finally, um, I address the question of governance. Um, here, what's critically important, I believe, not just for corporations and boards for companies, but more generally thinking about how to tackle climate uh, and address the climate action issues, is to think about not just focusing on the risk mitigation piece of climate, which is clearly urgent, clearly huge, and clearly important, but also thinking about upside opportunities uh, for investment, thinking about the renewable sector, thinking about making sure that we don't create pricing bubbles or create um, dislocations in the market that could actually force greater price uh, disruptions and actually harm living standards and also the healthcare and education access for many people in both developing and developed world. So let me conclude by saying that um, there's a lot of scope here for public policy to act. Um, I generally am not a big bureaucrat and a big believer um, in, in how government uh, um, can um, operate. Um, but fundamentally, it's very important to understand we will not solve this problem without a policy environment that is um, supportive towards having private sector capital um, come into the marketplace and support innovation um, in R and in D, both in research and in development, and clearly supports the rollout of uh, new technologies and new innovations to solve this very complicated um, and very challenged program. There's lots more that we can discuss, and many of, my de of the details are in the document, but I would love to now take your questions and to hear more from you, um, and through Benedict, um, who's coming right back. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Moyo. Um, so we're going to turn to some questions from our online audience um, shortly. Um, if you would like to raise your hand, please do. Um, you just need to raise your hand using the, the Zoom feature. Um, I'm going to use Chair's prerogative here and, uh, and ask you a, a couple of questions. We're, we're having this conversation on the eve of COP26. Um, what does success look like from your perspective for, for COP? Uh, it's been fraught negotiations um, over the last few months and, and a lot of uncertainty about what the end product will be. But from your perspective, what, is, what does success look like? Well, you know, thank you so much. It's a great question. Um, I think the first point that to me would be really important is for people to understand a few things. Uh, first of all, that we are actually dealing with something that's, when I when I talk about climate here, climate change, climate action, we're talking about a technology problem, um, meaning the, uh, the ability to reduce um, carbon emissions, um, as well as to think about investing in the new energy stack, which is low carbon, um, which includes solar, wind, geothermal, nuclear Gen 4 technologies, battery, etc. That conversation has to fundamentally appreciate the point that this is not something that just policy action can solve. Um, it has to be also driven by technological innovation. And we need to make sure that that piece is definitely uh, incorporated in the conversations. Um, some of the other things that I think will really define a win for COP26 is a recognition, um, as I mentioned um, a few moments ago, that we're not just jumping from one equilibrium today where 80% of, uh, of um, the, uh, the energy stack is satiated by uh, fossil fuels and, and carbon-based uh, uh, energies into one which we can magically switch into uh, where we are um, dependent on, uh, on low, uh, you know, sort of cost-effective, cost more affordable um, uh, energies such as solar and wind, etc. Um, that's just not possible. Uh, we need to actually figure out in, in a much more detailed, thoughtful, uh, considered way what actually that transition looks like and to think much more clearly about making sure that we don't uh, inadvertently penalize or prejudice people who are in the emerging markets um, where, um, you know, really on balance, uh, they are relatively not, places like Africa, South America are not contributing uh, or have not contributed to the emissions problem, but we want them to, to come on board. As many people know, the biggest uh, uh, offenders, so to speak, in terms of emissions remain China, the United States, uh, India third. Um, and, you know, personally, I think that it would be a big win if just even China and the U.S. came up with some really profound agreements um, uh, in terms of moving this discussion forward um, it, based on the 80-20 rule um, rather than uh, simply beating up on many countries around the world who are absolutely subscribed to a low-carbon future 
but you know, continue to grapple with the pandemic and questions of joblessness, unemployment, et cetera. Um, and maybe just uh, to be absolutely clear, I'm not a Luddite here. I'm not at all saying uh, that this is not urgent. Um, but I do think that we are at risk if we don't bring in a sort of sense into the conversations. We are at risk of uh, not only creating polarization among different countries, but I think we also will not jump start the $53 trillion uh, that, according to JP Morgan, actually is now earmarked, $53 trillion uh, earmarked toward ESG initiatives and mainly towards uh, environmental concerns. So we want to be able to do that, and I hope that there that, will that be conversations in daylight that will encourage those types of, of, of movements. Thank you. And, and of course, you, you mentioned um, the, the geopolitical tensions between China and the US. Um, President Xi has made headlines by saying he, he's not coming to COP26. Um, from, the, from the bordering perspective, uh, and, and you serve on a number of international boards, uh, where do you see um, those tensions playing out from an investment point of view? It, as regards climate change and, and yeah. the energy transition? So I think it's a, um, a, a couple of perspectives. So first of all, unfortunately, uh, the tensions or the schism that's emerged between the US and China is not just um, uh, sort of uh, about climate action and climate change. It has uh, many hallmarks we know around trade and supply chains, real concerns um, around uh, security, uh, technology, uh, et cetera. So it's a broader construct that needs to be uh, addressed. Um, you know, I uh, have spent a lot of time in both the United States and in China, and I would say on balance, I feel that, um, you know, that, that work is being done in both of these regions to try and redress um, some of the concerns that we've already discussed around emissions uh, and the need for investment to replace the existing energy stack. And I think China is, uh, is certainly making important moves in that direction. Um, the fact of the matter is that it's clearly not enough. As I mentioned earlier, emissions have been rising even when we've been at home. Um, and you know, we, there has to be due consideration for the fact that, as I mentioned earlier, we don't want to, to leave people behind um, in, in, a, in, a, in a very laudable pursuit of, uh, of trying to make sure that, uh, the, that society and humanity continues to progress. Um, but uh, you know, these are the, the concerns that we have because I do think that there's real uh, um, progress being made in China around solar, around new um, innovations. Um, but I think that um, in terms of uh, what perhaps uh, Western society in particular would like to see in terms of that speed up um, of, uh, of reduction in emissions and, and perhaps more investment, um, I think it, it can be seen as somewhat frustrating um, because there are, you know, with the advanced economies, uh, the, the question around sacrificing living standards is perhaps not as jarring um, in countries where there's a lot of in, uh, impoverished uh, uh, a part of the society. So there's clearly scope here for um, a, a sort of mutual discussion and mutual recognition, but I think a lot of sense needs to be brought into the conversation um, to, to basically understand the, the fact that progress is being made in, across the world, um, but at the same time, in order to, to make sure that it's, uh, it's sort of energized or catalyzed, um, that there is a sensitivity and understanding of the different contexts in which countries are finding themselves. Thank you. Well, we're going to turn to our audience now. As I said before, please do raise your hand using the Zoom feature if you uh, have a question. But I'm first going to turn to David Wood. Um, David, please would you um, keep your question short and make sure it's a question rather than your own mini speech. Um, and please let us know your name and organization at the start. David. Hello, I'm chair of London Futurist. I want to address this question of positioning to what extent should our actions in response to climate chaos be positioned as a sacrifice, a reduction in liberties, and to what extent is it really credible to position it as, as an economic opportunity? After all, uh, when we are talking about changes in lifestyle, many people in the UK say, why should we be cutting back when these countries over there aren't doing anything? And one answer is, well, actually, it's not just cutting back. It's an opportunity to get ahead on economic green growth. Is that credible? That's what I want to ask. Well, thank you for that, that question. And I, and I think that you're, you're absolutely raising the tension of, of uh, sort of livelihoods versus um, uh, living standards, which has been a very big feature also of the pandemic uh, discussions around uh, vaccine rollout. And I think it really goes to the heart of how um, societies, certainly in the UK, not just um, implement public policy, but also signal 
um, given their important role. Um, we're in global Britain now, within the G7 countries, really signal to the rest of the world what best practice might look like. Um, you will be aware, I'm sure, that many countries, particularly in the emerging markets, look at the industrialized West and say, well, wait a second, you, now that you have uh, very successfully gone through industrialization and created economic growth and moved living standards of your people, it's all well and good now to turn around and say uh, that uh, you, you want us to, to curb emissions. And there's real human costs um, in terms of education and health care um, and public goods um, if we are asked to make that sacrifice. Um, and, and, you know, it's not just about sacrifices, as you've pointed out, that need to be made in the developing world. Um, here, even in the, U in the uh, UK, um, we, if you look back in sort of um, some of the pledges around net zero, um, we have heard public policymakers worry about what these trade-offs might look like and how willing, um, even in, in British society or in the United States, people are willing to, uh, how willing they are to sacrifice um, the, uh, the, uh, the, the sort of in the, in the interest of the greater good to combat uh, carbon uh, emissions and to, to end up in a low-carbon future, how much they really are willing to sacrifice. Um, you know, the way I think about it is that the price response uh, to shortages of energy um, tend to be very, very much reflected in movement in the price. Uh, you know, supply leads to price movements very quickly. We've seen that right now in the UK, even though uh, a lot of the, the reasons we've seen the price increase has got to do with supply chains and things that are going on globally. Um, but we tend to see a very demand sticky uh, or sticky demand um, with respect to energy. People don't want to give up um, their living standards. And I think that's one of the areas that public policy has to deal with, um, whether it's through taxes and subsidies. Um, but I think, we, you know, if we are going to continue to keep the pie increasing from an economic uh, sense uh, over time, we are going to have to move the, the energy stack. And we are already thinking about why the, it's important to get more investment in this space. So, you know, are there sacrifices? I'm afraid so if we don't have an investment agenda as much as a risk mitigation agenda, which is why this document is very important. Thank you. And we'll move on to our second questioner, uh, Gwydion Prins. Uh, Gwydion, please give your name and organization, uh, followed by your short question. Certainly. Good, good morning. Can you hear me? Good morning, yes. Good. Uh, Professor Gwydion Prince, I, I was the founder of the Hartwell Group on Climate and Energy in 2007, and I'm now the director of the Cambridge um, uh, Security Initiative uh, Research Unit. Um, Professor Moyo, my, my question is really about the framing assumptions of the boards which you spoke of, um, and three in particular, really. I mean, do, do the members of the boardrooms recognize, firstly, that there is actually as a matter of fact, on IEA figures, no so-called green transition happening. I mean, 13% of TPE in 1971, 13.8 in 2019. Um, that there cannot be via policy forcing of thermodynamically incompetent thin renewables. Uh, secondly, that this forcing of thin renewables, wind, solar, and so on, is a classic rent-seeking bubble. Uh, it's, it's rendement of the South Seas. And thirdly, uh, and perhaps most importantly, geostrategically, that it's now quite clear that the uh, People's Republic of China has decided to and is weaponizing the current third cycle of Western uh, obsession with climate catastrophism to encourage us to self-harm in the, uh, the competition between the free world and authoritarian world. Um, thank you for that. I, I, I'll try and um, I, I think I got all your questions. But just um, in first of your first question, do there's a recognition that there's no um, energy transition or green transition? I, I would beg to give to differ. I actually, as as you heard, I serve on not just a, a corporate board um, of an energy company, but I'm also um, in an endowment uh, for Oxford University Investment Committee, um, where we are actually practically making um, very, very um, specific moves um, in terms of uh, the allocation of resources. Um, some people have gone as aggressively as to campaign for defunding um, of energy companies. And actually, I think if you look at just the, the markets, 
Um, I think there's clearly been a massive shift in, uh, in this, how much capital and how much uh, effort is being put into the traditional conventional energy sector versus more renewables. In fact, I, I published an article just last week in the Financial Times that expresses some of this data. But just to give you a couple of quick statistics, um, 25 years ago, uh, energy, the energy sector uh, represented about 25 percent of the largest uh, stock markets and really was a, a very key piece of the investment stack of um, many investors, um, pension funds, uh, many of them public, insurers, as, and many institutional investors. Um, that today is less than 2%. Um, and in, in that respect, institutional investors are moving away and actually taking that capital and moving it into renewables, which is what the piece was really highlighting, that there's now enormous multiples, um, an enormous, um, uh, some might even argue, uh, a green um, a sort of a, a, a net zero bubble that's emerged in the renewable sector um, because there's so much capital moving into that space. So I do think that uh, that it, it's not just in public policy where there are uh, admish, admonitions for or sort of encouragement, certainly for net zero targets um, being accomplished, um, but certainly um, public policy is being backed up by um, many corporations, many investors who are, in, in, a, in many sense, um, uh, almost uh, uh, front-running public policy, because even when there is a vacuum in countries like the U.S. that don't have a net zero, uh, explicit net zero policy, we still see um, uh, business following up with, with real tangible movements in capital and how they think about um, uh, um, investment in this space. Um, your second question is around rent-seeking um, and creating bubbles. I, I think I'd need to understand more what you mean in terms of that. Uh, I'm not quite sure, uh, you know, rent-seeking uh, um, around uh, around the transition, I wasn't entirely clear uh, what you meant. Um, your third point was around China um, weaponizing. You know, I, I'm a little bit more sanguine, perhaps, than you might be. Um, I, you know, the China today uh, is not just uh, uh, the second largest economy in the world. Um, they are a, an enormous uh, foreign direct investor, trading partner, and lender to many countries around the world. In fact. China is the large, second largest, excuse me, I beg your pardon, is the largest uh, um, foreign lender to the U.S. government. Um, and the truth is, is a, a sense that, it, you know, that, that there's a symbiosis between uh, Western society and China, and that, if anything, um, having some kind of a, a agreement, not just in general, about how to manage the global economy and to think about investment and opportunity uh, for society around the world, but specifically trying to address climate change will require that all voices have a table, uh, have a seat at the table. I, I should just say that I, I worry a lot um, that by creating an us versus them or, you know, um, perhaps uh, uh, ascribing sort of sinister motives or, you know, perhaps, uh, you know, a, a, a sort of uh, uh, putting countries like China offside because of, uh, because of their uh, a, a different approach uh, politically and economically um, actually, to my mind, uh, worsens our chances of, of solving um, something like uh, the uh, the climate action situation that we find ourselves in. Um, and this is not to say that I'm a sinophile and don't recognize that there are many aspects of that society that I think um, I would argue could be better. But I do really caution uh, us, given the importance and the urgency and the scale of the problem of climate, um, from putting countries like China offside, because I don't think that that helps solve the bigger problem that all of us are going to face around climate. We're going to move on now to our next questioner, um, Kuseni Dlamini. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, Kuseni, uh, name an organization, please. Kuseni. Hello, you can you hear me? Yes, yes we, we can. can hear you right. now. Well, thank you very much. I I'm Kuseni Dlamini, chairman of Mass Smart, uh, a retail company in Sub-Saharan Africa. And I'm also chairman of Aspen Pharmacare. We are producing the Johnson & Johnson um, vaccine in South Africa, for Africa and the rest of the world. And thank you very much for a very insightful uh, a keynote speech, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Moyo. Uh, my question has to do with uh, the issue of global energy shortages that we have seen recently. I would like to know what, what your view is in terms of the impact or implications it will have for the energy transition and what can we do to make sure that it doesn't slow down the momentum or indeed reverse some of the gains that you have alluded to in your speech in terms of uh, the, the energy transition. Thank you. 
So um, thank you for that. I'm, I'm conscious of time, um, so I, I'll try and give it a, a, a sort of a very briefly, and we can talk more later, or you know, we're happy to engage with you in a separate forum. But there are sort of two two key aspects um, that I see at, at, at risk. Um, so first of all, um, we as we have been pursuing very aggressively, certainly since COP16, um, the Paris Accord, et cetera, um, a movement to, away from the current uh, conventional energy stack, carbon-based energy stack, um, there, there's a risk um, that, uh, that we see higher prices. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, demand tends to be quite sticky for, for energy and, and perhaps would even arguably grow according to some of the IEA forecasts because the population is going to be closer to 10 billion people in 2050. Um, and it's sticky because um, the supply pressures um, of an underinvestment in conventional energies um, that we can actually deliver at scale um, today um, means that there's a constraint in, in supply um, that is happening uh, across the world. So that's one piece of these supply shortages. They are not just about um, uh, you know, logistics and supply chain disruption, which of course they are, uh, explain a large part of it, but they are also, to my mind, uh, very emblematic of an underinvestment in conventional energy that's been going on for some time and I'm afraid uh, is likely to continue if we don't manage the transition in a sort of sensible way. What does sensible look like? It might, it might look at, at um, sort of improving the current exi uh, the existing energy stack through things like carbon sequestration um, and, and uh, think carbon capture um, as innovations as opposed to just saying let's defund and shut them down. Um, that's some, one of the areas I think is really important. The other Another area in which I think that uh, uh, the sort of uh, shortages uh, of, of, uh, of energy, um, you know, regardless of their origins, whether supply constraints or underinvestment in conventionals, um, could lead to being to higher prices is through renewables. Um, and I mentioned this already: this idea of net zero inflation or green inflation, the fact that the the types of energy that many people um, would like to see that are low carbon um, are, are actually generally um, hard to scale and they can be quite costly in terms of their cost curves. So that includes things like hydrogen and nuclear and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, solar, wind, uh, geothermal, biofuels, etc. There's a whole stack of energies that are certainly going to be cleaner and better for, for um, the future uh, equilibrium that we're pursuing in terms of low carbon. But in the here and now, we've not been able to, to create them at scale in a cost-effective way. Um, and, and certainly, we are already seeing in the market, as I said, the FT piece I wrote last week, um, it's putting additional pressures on the, on the energy market. And what, and what that means for cost of living is, to, to my mind, um, more risk of, of inflation coming from that, uh, higher prices um, than, than perhaps we would like in a transitionary, a transitionary approach. Thank you. And to Nina Smith. Nina, name and organization, please, and a short question as we're nearing the end. Uh, Nina Smith, I'm a public transport and environment campaigner. Um, can we achieve global warming of no more than plus 1.5% uh, degrees centigrade when political parties and governments think five years ahead instead of 50 and, and adopt climate destructive populist policies to appease their supporters and funders and to win elections? And sort of a second question, if I may, very briefly, should ecocide uh, get, be a crime against humanity? And I'm thinking particularly of President Bolsonaro here. Um, I'll leave the second question off because I think that's more of a political question. I, I, I don't know enough of specifics what, what uh, aspect you're refer, referring to, and I don't like to uh, sort of uh, sort of cast aspersions on how people should vote. That's the essence of democracy. So you know we have to respect the, the democratic decisions that people make in their respective countries. Um, with respect to the short termism that you're referring to, it clearly is problematic, not just in the instance of climate, but also for thinking about education, healthcare, long term term problems, pensions, infrastructure, these are long-term multi-generational problems. And I think that anything that uh, forces or encourages or rewards um, short-term thinking, um, I, I think is particularly problematic. And again, in the article, um, but more generally in my work, I talk a lot about not just identifying that this, there's a schism between the long-term problems that we have and the short-term cycles that perhaps um, encourage uh, poor policy making, but I also come up with specific proposals on how we might bridge 
that gap. Um, in the specific context, something like COP26 really should have an opportunity for upside because you hope that, um, you know, in, in, where it's, it's less about nation governments and it's much more about global efforts, um, that we would move away from the short-termism term that's embedded, particularly in democratic societies, um, and really try to bring a, a global perspective that would be much more uh, akin to solving or bridging that gap between long-term problems and the way public policymakers uh, address this issue. Um, a very specific point in my regard, in terms of my contribution, is about investment. Boards do think about corporations longer term. We're not just there for three-year cycles. Um, I've been on a board that's been, a company that's been around for 330 years. Um, and so thinking about longevity and, and long-term investment is absolutely going to be key, not just in terms of innovation, but specifically in terms of how we deal with this problem of, uh, of climate and how we act against it. Thank you. Uh, we have two more questioners uh, left. Please do keep your questions as, as tight as you possibly can because uh, we're running out of time. But Chris Russell, Chris, name an organization, please. Uh, thank you very much, Chris Russell. I'm a non-exec director of various investment companies and chairman of the Rough Investment Company. My question uh, relates to nuclear, given credible solutions to nuclear waste. To what extent can nuclear contribute to net zero by 2050? So I think that's a wonderful question because my approach on this is that we should not a priori uh, eliminate certain things. This is the scale, the consequence, the urgency of climate um, uh, action, but also climate change means that everything should be on the table. Um, and this is why one of the things that concerns me is that sort of um, some pockets, some some groups uh, feel that, you know, we should take the view that, uh, you know, a priori anything renewable is great and anything non-renewable is awful. And I just think that there's a middle ground that requires innovation and science and technology to think about these, these you know, possibilities in a much more um, open-minded fashion. Um, whether or not, as I mentioned, through carbon sequestration, we can improve the existing stack. Um, we are trying to find scalable, um, uh, uh, cost-effective, and clean solutions. And the truth is, if somebody knew how to do that, we would have the answer. But the, the, the very fact that we don't have an answer uh, suggests that we should have um, all hands on deck and, and really uh, everyone contributing uh, as much as possible to try and address uh, the, the climate situation. It, so in, in a nutshell, I think nuclear should absolutely be a part of that suite. Um, given the urgency, given what we're trying to achieve, um, and given that there's still over a billion people, 15% of the world's population that has no access to energy, uh, living in darkness and really with real consequences for living standards, I don't see how we can really uh, you know, ignore the, the importance of, of really thinking about everything being on, uh, being uh, up for discussion and up for debate and really driving funding as well to support that through um, innovation and, uh, and investment. And finally, Kahinde Akinola, uh, please give your name and organization and please do keep it short. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so um, I'm Ken Diakiola. Um, I am technical assistant to the managing director of Nigeria LNG Limited. Uh, my question, uh, Dr. Dambisa, uh, fantastic presentation. Um, there are schools of thoughts uh, that believe that energy transition will slow down growth and development of many emerging nations like uh, Brazil, Russia, uh, Nigeria, Turkey. And uh, overall, that it favors the global north against the global south. Uh, what's your take on this? So this is one of the areas that, as I mentioned earlier, I think is going to be really important to smooth over or to really to, to take seriously in COP26. Um, we cannot create an us versus them. I think that would be long-term detrimental for everybody. It's sort of a mutual, uh, mutually agreed upon uh, sort of suicide for, the, for, the, for society. So we have to really infuse the discussions with the perspective, uh, as you say, from the global south. And I, I do worry um, every now and then that perhaps that perspective hasn't really been adequately uh, adopted. Um, I think that just to put your question in, in perspective, um, even before COVID hit, the global economy was already suffering from concerns around low growth. Um, I know there's skeptics out there on, on whether growth matters or how we should achieve growth, and we can talk about that for sure. Um, but I think there are two points. One is that we need 3% growth per year in order to double 
per capita incomes in a generation, which is about 25 years. Many emerging as well as developed economies are far below that 3% number. Um, and so we, sh we need to be worried. Without economic growth, we cannot improve living standards. We won't get innovation that we need to solve these big public policy uh, challenges. And I really also worry that uh, you won't see the sort of political, uh, competitive political elections and democracies that we really like, where really you're assuming that you have a, uh, uh, a middle class that's able to hold the government accountable. So we do need growth. There's no doubt about it. Um, it's not an accident that uh, the COVID vaccine has come from um, developed economies. Um, it, it's really, to my mind, the, the questions around living standards, access to vaccines, but more generally to improvements in living standards is something that's at the heart of this, uh, this growth question. The second point I really just want to mention really quickly is that you know, in a way, um, society, governments, individuals, we're all guilty of um, the fact that we've had uh, a, a massive negative externality, a massive cost um, that has accrued over several centuries, which is basically climate change. Um, the, the problem that we're trying to, do, to solve right now, which is uh, for economists out there, you'll know Coase's theorem is that when you have a big externality like this, um, somebody has to be assigned the responsibility of solving for the cost. Um, and right now, this goes back to my, my point that I made in my opening remarks, is that right now it's not entirely clear who that someone might be. Um, it's very easy to, to say we should defund private corporations, but the truth of the matter is about 80% of the supply um, currently uh, of, of, of energy is coming from state-owned enterprises, um, Saudi Aramco, Sinoc from China, uh, PDVSA from uh, Venezuela, uh, Brazil, etc. So there's a much more complicated issue around how do we think about solving this public goods problem, but I can assure you we will not solve it without technological uh, advancements. And I think, you know, really to sum up uh, my answer in, in one point, um, you know, is green growth possible? Um, yes, it is, um, as long as we can get affordable, scalable uh, innovations um, to solve the energy crisis. If we can unlock that, which is why the investment uh, question is so critical, get governments to, to support policies or provide policies that support um, a better and more investment in these innovations, that means that we won't have to even have to worry about answering the question about whether we need to sacrifice growth um, versus uh, um, sustainability. They should be um, simpatico, um, but uh, I think until we, we really encourage that 50 trillion that JP Morgan has talked about and others, uh, that real amount is going into energy that creates sustainable, scalable, cost-effective uh, energy interventions, uh, we are going to continue to worry about this tension. So it's a very good point, um, but I'm, I'm fundamentally optimistic that we can do both. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that rounds up our speech and, and Q&A. So uh, thank you very much, Dr. Moyo, for joining us today for a, a vibrant discussion. Um, thank you very much, everybody who's tuned in today um, online. And uh, for those uh, looking, to, looking for our, our new edition of our journal, it'll be available today at policyexchange.org.uk. And if you'd like it straight into your inbox, uh, sign up for our newsletter and uh, we'll send it straight to you. But thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Moyo. Thank you. Good day.